Yowzers, and welcome to the Daily Space Weather. You may have heard about a little bit of solar activity happening yesterday. Don't worry, we'll cover it here at the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. It's an exciting day for things like space weather. We'll just bring you the most detailed imagery of the sun you'll find anywhere in the universe. The known universe. This is the past 24 hours, and you might see a little bit of activity happening associated with this sunspot. Likelihood of additional major solar flares remains very, very high. Also, likelihood of coronal mass ejections remains nearly 100%. Again, you may have heard about a little bit of X-class flare activity happening, maybe, uh, in the past, oh, I don't know, 24 hours? Uh, feast your eyes on this. That's only two hours of solar activity right there. And uh, don't worry, we've got some extreme close-ups. That's only 10 frames per second. We usually show 30. Let's take a look at yesterday plus today in terms of SDO intensity gram. So there are your sunspots. They've been mostly stable. A little bit of growth in this group down here in the north, well, the south well, the southeast here, right there. There you go. Right there. A little bit of growth there. Besides that, most of these sunspot groups have been stable. Here's SDO magnetogram for the same period. That is yesterday, February 11th, plus today, Sunday, February 12th. So let's take a brief look at what's going on on Croissant Earth before we get back to space. Sakura Jima is erupting volcanic ash not identifiable in satellite imagery. Public table exploding, flight level 220. It's a 22,000 foot ash plume over central Mexico. Fuego in Guatemala exploding, flight level 150. It's a 15,000 foot ash plume over Guatemala. Nevado del Ruiz exploding, flight level 230 over Colombia. It's a 23,000 foot ash plume. Cotopaxi has dispersed its volcanic ash in Sabacaya. We're unable to detect if the Peruvian volcano is erupting or not, probably due to cloudy images. Please don't pull vault the caldera. Next, looking at global seismicity, there is your 90-day bar graph from VolcanoDiscovery.com. Largest quake of the past 24 was only a 5.6 magnitude here at the African-slash-South American plate boundary, south in the South Atlantic. So anyway, that was a 5.6. That happened at 1531 yesterday. And let's continue up the list here. It's been pretty calm, seismically speaking. Only a couple of quakes there over a 5 magnitude. Maybe only one. Make it two. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge also had a 5.0. So both the quakes over a 5 magnitude occurring in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge area. Oh, there was also a 5.0 at the Philippines. And before we get back to space, a quick reminder. Please support the channel via the Smash Team site. If you've never seen it before, check it out, smashomash.com slash smash team. We built our own subscription services site back in October of 2021 when we launched smashomash.com slash smash team. You'll get email alerts and so on if you sign up for them. There is a bronze, a silver, a gold, and a gold annual paid-up subscription level. The best value is the gold annual paid-up subscription as it includes complimentary merch. It's almost like getting four months of a gold membership for free, so check that out. Smashomash.com slash smash team links below the video as well as on our homepage and welcome to the Neo Renaissance. Today's featured bike shop is our UCI trade team. Yeah, I'm wearing the gear. The Velo Shop. It's my UCI trade team. So yeah. I ride for Velo Shop, and if you visit the Lehigh Valley, why not stop by? Becky and Don probably know a lot more about bicycles than you do. There's Becky <clears throat> with a very determined look on her face. And, uh, yeah, you'll find some great stuff on the website there, great knowledge at the shop. So come visit us in Lehigh Valley if you like riding your bike. Save 10% on your next purchase by signing up for the email list. Also below the video, you may find links to our Red Bubble shop. The products will be listed in order of best selling if you click that link. Thanks to everybody who has. Thanks to everybody who's picked up merch. Give Smash Staff a raise by picking up some merch of your own. Perhaps get a souvenir. And congratulations on surviving a global scandemic so far. You're doing a fine job. A fine job in being, well, not dead. Which brings us to today's featured product, which is Smasher Price, my first, my first pandemic. 
As most of you are experiencing your first pandemic, if you're not well over 100 years old, you would have never experienced a pandemic before. So congratulations on that. You're doing a fine job, a fine job in not being dead. So perhaps pick up a souvenir, help the channel out by picking up some merch, perhaps a mini skirt featuring the planet wearing a giant mask, because that's been real effective, right? You may ask yourself, where is accountability? And so do we. There is zero accountability in banana republics because reasons, and let's get back to space because it's pretty serious. Here's the last 24 hours in SDO 304 angstroms. And indeed, you'll see an X-class flare occurring right down here. Peak flux was around 1550 universal time yesterday. We've also got the 171 angstroms wavelength. And again, don't worry, we're going to show you some extreme close-ups of that. We've got some spectacular imagery, perhaps unprecedented even on our channel. So when the sun ups its game, so do we. We rise to the occasion as we realize there'd be a lot of work to do in Solar Cycle 25, an exciting solar cycle to say the least. 10.7 centimeter radio flux now up to 210 solar flux units. There is the one-year chart to put that in context, and it looks like the NOAA sunspot number now all the way up to 209, something like that, very close to in line with the radio flux. Well over 200 sunspots now showing up from NOAA. If you still think it's a grand solar minimum, I don't know what to tell you. You're believing dogma instead of looking at facts. Next, looking at the Space Weather Enthusiast dashboard to see it's clear sailing between Earth and Sun at the moment. We don't see any forecasted geomagnetic storms or geomagnetic unrest periods there by NOAA. And I would tend to agree, although there are coronal mass ejections to cover, we don't think they're earthly directed. Next, let's take a look at Earth's magnetic environment. Here's the KP index. It is currently at 2. KP2, geomagnetically calm conditions. And let's take a look at a visualization of Earth's magnetic moment from space. So there's Earth's magnetic moment from space. The units depicted in this imagery are nanopascals. That's magnetohydrodynamic pressure. And that should be the last four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from space. Things have been pretty uneventful in the past 24 hours in terms of solar wind. We'll show you the detailed imagery on that in a minute. First Earth's magnetic moment from the ground. This will show you the most likely locations for geomagnetic, geomagnetic geomagnetically induced Railway, pipeline, power line, induction, the most likely place to see aurora will show up on this imagery. This depicts magnetic flux density, or nanotesla, and it is also the last four hours. And let's go to the real-time solar wind. So it's been pretty unremarkable here for the past 24 hours. Current conditions are about 467 kilometers per second for the solar wind speed. Solar wind density just over 6 protons per cubic centimeter. And let's take a look at some magnetic data. So we are expecting to see a little lower readings out of this. We're expecting a little lower highs and maybe even lower lows on tomorrow's GOES magnetometer data. We've learned how to forecast this by immersing ourselves in the data. So yeah, expect a little bit lower levels. That's the past three days as measured by the GOES 16 and GOES 18. And let's move on to the heliospheric current sheet next. Earth lies in a North Pole current sheet. We don't see any apparent likely changes coming anytime soon there. South Pole current sheet here moving to the opposite side of the sun depicted in red. Here's our line of sight field plot depicting the sun's B field in blue. The B field is the field that goes through a magnet, this magnet being the sun. This also depicts the solar polar fields in red for south and green for north. As you can see, the north pole, the north magnetic pole of the sun is in the process of facing right toward the earth. That brings us to coronal holes, which give us great insight into the solar polar field reversal process that is a sunspot cycle. Now, some people may believe that a sunspot cycle is simply the sunspot number, but it's a lot more complex than that, folks. The solar sunspot cycle is not just sunspots coming up and down. It is also the solar polar fields reversing. So every 11 years, approximately, the north solar pole becomes the south and vice versa. And the coronal holes show us the progress of that process. That's why we show the line of sight coronal hole plot daily. And let's just go back for a brief moment to the top view of the plane field plot because we have seen some migration of the north solar polar field away from 
the North Heliographic Pole. There you can see it's shrinking and then it's kind of still hanging out there. So it hasn't left the North Pole yet, which means, well, we've got a long way to go to reach solar maximum for solar cycle 25. You can expect very little to no magnetism at the poles at solar maximum, as all the coronal holes should be in the process of migrating, midway through their process of migrating, hence more around the equator. Here's SDO for the past 24 hours in 211 angstroms. That's part of the extreme ultraviolet electromagnetic spectrum. And that is a fairly well-defined transequatorial coronal hole there. And it is certainly of North Pole orientation. So we should see a little bit of an increase in the solar wind here in a, about three, three or four days from that. Uh, it's not super well defined, but there should be some signal there as, again, it's clear sailing largely between Earth and Sun. Next, we'll move to sunspots. And again, there are quite a lot likelihood of large solar flares, nearly 100%. Don't be surprised to see additional X-class flares. We've got a very magnetically complex group setting up here in the northwest that increases its propensity to produce large flares. And of course, the main, the largest flare has been an X-class flare in the past 24 hours. That was from Sunspot 3220. And you can see the likelihood of an X-class flare there going up above 60% at one point during that flare probability monitor. And let's take a look at sunspots before we move into the real money shots of this video. So there is your SDO magnetogram for the past 24 hours. Again, things mostly stable except for the growth of this sunspot down here. So there's some major leading umbral growth there on that group in the south. You can see it in the magnetic fields. You'll see it also in the SDO continuum imagery. Good stuff. And several sunspots there are larger than the Earth at least in terms of their two-dimensional size. And next we'll move to relativistic particles and solar flares, which will be the story of the day all over the internet. And approximately 14 people will actually see our video. Don't forget to press like, by the way. If we see 50 likes, we will do a live stream later today. Those 50 likes have to come in on the same calendar date the video was released. Anyway, no major spikes in the energetic particles there. Just a tiny little upticks there in the ghost proton flux, nothing to write home about. However, the X-ray flux did feature a significant flare of X-class. It was only an X1 flare, however. Uh, that's been the largest flare for quite a long time. That's your three-day GOES X-ray flux. Let's bring up the one day just to show you a little more resolution there. Again, peak flux was around 1550 universal time yesterday on the 11th and we're having an m class flare happening at least an m class flare happening as we stream the video and let's take a look at some 24 hour views there's 131 angstroms for the past 24 hours we'll also show 94 angstroms and then we'll do some serious zoom ins and <laughs> you will be impressed I promise. So that's 94 angstroms for yesterday, plus, well, the last 24 hours from when we streamed the video approximately. And here are some money shots. That's only two hours of activity. We've slowed that down to one third normal speed. That's 10 frames per second instead of 30. And if you weren't already aware, 131 and 94 angstroms are specifically designed to view solar flares. They take 10 images per minute instead of only two images per minute like the other wavelengths. So here's some great up close imagery of that flare as it happens. Two hours from SDO. Don't worry, we've got lots more images here. So this may look quiet. That's the same two hours there. No significant changes happening to the umbrae around that area. That's that whole run. Having trouble telling when the flare even occurred? Well, that would make sense. As it's not really even visible in the imagery. Also, if you look at the magnetic fields, you may be surprised to realize that no changes to the magnetic fields happen, at least no major ones. 
That's that same two-hour run. Are you noticing any differences? We're certainly not. We've got even more fantastic imagery here. Here we've added 131 angstroms to the SDO magnetogram to show you how noisy the seas can be above a quiet solar surface. So photosphere there looking quite quiet. Corona there looking a little on the hot side. Next we've got, let's see, this is 171 plus 304 angstroms. You can see a bunch of plasma moving around there. We'll let that play through a second time and then we'll zoom in even closer. So no major CME associated with that, if any at all. It looks like most of the plasma either stayed suspended or collapsed back down. It'll be a little more obvious in this imagery. That's 171 plus 304 angstroms. Those are, by the way, ionized iron at 171 angstroms and helium at 304 angstroms. So how you like them apples? Here's 304 angstroms by itself. Just the ionized helium. And let's just say those areas that appear white have a lot of helium. And that, my friends, is some spectacular imagery. All right, let's continue on here to see what's going on overhead, something we're always interested in. And we encourage you, the viewer, to look up. This is what's happening over Lehigh Valley. The sun here rising up here, chasing Mercury across the ecliptic. And the moon is also visible over there, leaving Libra and entering Virgo. That's what's going on over Lehigh Valley. This is skyandtelescope.org's star chart. Here's your solar system forecast. Here's where heavenly bodies are now. We'll advance this one week. Here's where things will be on the 19th, approaching the February new moon as Earth is in a very lonely side of the planet devoid of gas giants. And let's take a look at coronagraphs because coronal mass ejections are always people's concern when viewing videos about space weather, and I don't blame you. So there's yesterday's images from George Mason University. And there were some CMEs. Again, you may be wondering if they're earthly directed. So don't worry, we'll show you a little more information here. Here's today's images also. That's 51 more frames. And let's take a look at the view from Stereo A and the Soho Lasco C3. Now, if you're a new viewer, congratulations on realizing the channel exists. We're surprised. From Stereo A's perspective, Earth would be off in the direction of that purple arrow. So any coronal mass ejections would have to be on that line. And then typically we would see them creating a halo around the Soho Lasco C3. We don't see any of that, which is why we don't think any of those coronal mass ejections are Earthly directed. So based on the imagery we have here, no Earth-directed coronal mass ejections. Here's the past 24 hours. And uh, some CMEs on the far side of the sun there and so on. Thanks for asking about hitting the bunkers, Mike. And the answer is uh, uh, no. It's not time to hit the bunker. Especially if your bunker's not the right depth. I mean, your bunker's got to be just the right depth, folks. If It's it's got to be deeper than a basement and shallower than a, than a super fortress style military bunker. It's got to be somewhere in the middle, according to certain utter hacks on uh, YouTube talking about space weather. How about if we zoom in a little bit closer? So a bunch of CMEs there, they're not earthly directed. They're on the far side and pretty much going every direction besides at Earth.
And next we'll look at filaments because there are lots. In fact, one of those filaments is actually becoming a prominence as we speak. So here's the data from El Taide, Spain's ground-based solar observatory. And you can see right over here, this is our, our filament named the Hulk Hogan filament. And you can see it's starting to hang off the edge of the sun, a great indication that that filament is becoming a prominence. Really, they're the same feature, folks. It's just a matter of the location and your perspective. So anyway, we've got a bunch of filaments that we could name here. We've got this one here, the three down here, four down here, five down here, uh, lots of filaments. So if you'd like to name filaments, join us on Twitter to name that filament. You're invited to mark up the image. You know, use your smartphone, take a screenshot of it, edit the photo, things like that. Join us on Twitter, since there are approximately four people that see any of our tweets ever, since the pathetic and putrid shadow bans continue on all of the social media sites, not just Elon's putrid Twitter site, but all of the putrid sites, quote, social and quote, media. What a joke. Anyway, once again, you're invited to, because of space weather, name that filament. We name filaments after living humans on the channel. So if you've got somebody you'd like to name filaments after, feel free. You got to do it on Twitter. If you don't have a Twitter account, why not create one? You'll see all kinds of stuff not about space weather and meteorology on our Twitter feed. Press like and subscribe if you enjoy the content on YouTube. Yes, I know. The censorship is utterly putrid on YouTube. It's utterly putrid and disgusting. And of course, propaganda, nonsense, and fraud are promoted to the tune of probably billions of dollars per year. If we do get 50 likes throughout the day today, we will do a live stream. So press the like button. Yesterday when we looked at this morning's stats, we saw 180 views on yesterday's video and 49 likes. So yeah, uh, no live stream occurred yesterday. If we see 50 likes throughout the day today, we will stream live. Support the channel via clicks via the homepage, smashomash.com. You can find links to the Hemp Lucid Shop. By the way, on the Twitter feed, pasted to our profile, you can also find, pinned to our profile rather, you can also find a link to get free mushroom gummies from Hemp Lucid for various different purposes. Hemp Lucid link also there on the homepage, Twitter link, Instagram, permanent invite link to the Discord chat, link to the Smash O Forum, where we just put up a new topic about ultra healthy foods. So yeah, thanks to everybody who's helped the channel out. We launched our own website in 2019 because of pathetic and disgusting censorship on Facebook. And then we watched their share price decline. So that was that was great. You know, we said, hey, middle finger to you, up yours, Facebook. And their share price went down and down and down. And now they're still trying to create a virtual universe as if gaming didn't do that decades ago. What a joke as they operate 20 year outdated software. If you haven't checked out the Hemp Lucid Shop, it's our latest and perhaps our greatest affiliate slash sponsor. So again, you can find the free link, the free mushroom gummies link, no shipping or credit card required for that on the Twitter page and save some cash by using the promo code smashomash10 on checkout or just shop via our link. People very impressed by the products, more product reviews coming and you can find playlists about that on the YouTube channel as well. And let's return to space once again. Here's the past 24 hours in one of our new house favorite composites. This is 171 plus 131 angstroms. And it's time for our bonus features right after we show the past couple of hours here from the Go 16 SUVI. So this is what we like to stream throughout the day because it's so good at showing coronal mass ejections. With its wide field of view, it shows the extended corona in ionized helium. You can also find some other wavelengths there if you like on the Space Weather Prediction Center's GOES 16 SUVI page. And that latest M-Class flare. Where did it come from? Let us know in the comments what you think. Uh, uh, oh, it came from up here. All right, so there we go. One of those setting regions producing an M-Class flare. And here come bonus features. So satellite charging hazards here do exist. They're of the 
low-energy electron variety building up on the surfaces of satellites in the central Pacific Ocean at the moment. No major charging hazards. Here is your GOES electron flux over the past three days here, just reaching up toward warning levels there, which is, that's showing particles. It also coincides with 1,000 pulse flux units. Sometimes we send out alerts about this if it's going to be an issue with communications. Sometimes high electron flux can cause some issues with communications and, of course, can damage satellites. There's your NOAA forecast, expecting relatively flat levels of electron flux here for the next three days. No argument from me there. Here's the one-year chart to put that in context, the relativistic electrons. Those are, locate, those are measured at the F layer of the ionosphere, so let's show that next. That's located at about 300 kilometers of altitude, and here is the vibrational frequency of the bridge between Earth and space. So there's a lot of stuff shaken up there, but there's not a lot of stuff up there, if that makes sense. It's very diffuse. You wouldn't want to try to breathe at 300 kilometers of altitude. It would be unhealthful. However, most of those particles up there are ions, charged particles, because that's sort of outside of Earth's atmospheric shielding. And lots of ionizing radiation makes it down to the F layer. We've been citing some interesting anomalies in this for the past couple of months. Here is your anomaly gram. That's anomaly in megahertz from a 30-day median. A couple things to note. The South African anomaly is now around equatorial Africa, right near the west equatorial coast. The South Atlantic anomaly back over the South American continent, right about where that dot is. Those are the two weakest spots in the ionosphere or you could say an Earth's magnetic field period. Anyway, here's the latest image. That's 1345 universal time ionogram and 1345 universal time anomaly gram. High frequency anomalies happening here at the moment. Again, that's anomaly in megahertz from a 30 day median. And let's take a look at the likelihood of GPS errors, which have been quite high here for the past couple of months. The total electron content forecast is the coupled thermosphere, ionosphere, plasmasphere, electrodynamics model. And what that ultimately means, folks, is that your GPS satellite must communicate through free electrons. So here you've got the outer Van Allen belt. Here you've got a plasmasphere. Here you've got the inner Van Allen belt. Here you've got another plasmasphere. And then below that is the ionosphere. Those free electrons cause signal refraction. And here are the most likely places to see that signal refraction. It's the coupled thermosphere, ionosphere, plasmasphere, electrodynamics model. So highly anomalous here, actually. We're seeing fairly nominal levels of electron flux, and we're seeing very uh, anomalously spread out total electron contents. Normally, this is much more concentrated around the equator at noon. We're seeing huge nighttime errors here. Major anomalies in the total electron content continue. And they're producing GPS errors in perhaps unexpected locations. So that'll help you to navigate. Use your Wi-Fi accuracy location. That might help you navigate if you're only using a GPS. Let's bring up the latest image of the closest star. And thanks for stargazing with us. Here is the colorized magnetogram. And do we have any new sunspots rising up here? Perhaps some new sunspots forming there in the northeast. So I would say keep your eye on this area as well as this area since it's already produced an X-class flare. We could see major flares in the northwest limb as well. Here's your rock back. And let's move to meteorology. So we don't just cover space weather on the channel. And, you know, today's video is... Uh, Today's video is pretty lengthy because of those X-ray flare close-ups. Today we're starting out our meteorology segment with our nullschool.net imagery. So that's the, the brightest part of the local planet. That's your, that's, that's your UV index. So that's the UV index and erythemal dose rate. 
And if you're wondering what's happening right here, maybe this is something to be freaked out about. Oh, my God, look at this, folks. Look at this. There's a spot here where there's the UV. It's not making it to the surface. What could be going on there? What could be possibly happening, folks? What could possibly be happening? And I'll, I'll tell you what could be happening. Clouds. Clouds could be happening. So how about if we, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, how about total cloud water? And what do you know? Clouds are blocking sunlight from making it to the surface. It's groundbreaking information here in our meteorology segment. And of course, people have been saying a lot of crazy things in our comments over the past couple of years about things like weather and space weather and the relationship therein and so on. And it's just, it's, it's interesting to say the least. Anyway, let's <clears throat> blast through the rest of our video here. Here's our meteorology segment kicking off with surface winds of the eastern world. A bunch of low pressures there in the southern hemisphere and one south of the Aleutians as well in the north. These are the jet streams. Like sands through the hourglass of time, these are the jet streams of your lives. These are the jet streams of the western world. And thanks for leaving a comment. Tin Man 1057. Sorry, Mike, we can't name the filament unless you do it on Twitter. So those are the jets of the West. These are the surface winds of the West. Strong low here off the coast of North Carolina as well as south of Greenland. Here are the surface winds of the central world. And these are the jet streams. Check it out. We've got a upper level high pressure system rotating clockwise there. It's almost like Jupiter's great red spot, only not great, not red, and not as strong. That clockwise rotation indicates an upper level high. And let's move on to see what's going on over the Americas in terms of clouds and fog. So that's 3.9 nanometer infrared radiation. Great at showing clouds and fog because half of that map would still be dark using the visible satellite. And we've got another strong low there over Georgia. We'll get to it. First, our weather.gov map. If your location's lit, click your location. We'll scroll down to briefly show the key. Lots of weather there around Hawaii. And let's show some forecasts. So this is your wind and pressure forecast based on the GFS model for the next 72 hours. Some heavy winds here expected in the southwestern portion of the country, the western portion of the country in general, and up the east coast. So that depicts wind and pressure. Here's the same model depicting pressure and precipitation. Again, 72-hour GFS model. Some heavy snow there coming from the northwest down through the Rockies. And we'll also show temperature anomaly forecast as it feels like spring in many parts of the country. Some very warm weather there coming to Illinois, Indiana. At like 20 degrees Celsius above normal, that's your 72-hour GFS temperature anomaly forecast in degrees Celsius. And uh, west of the Mississippi, it's going to be less than warm. Anomalously cold in the left half of the country and anomalously, anomalously cold in the left half of the country and anomalously warm in the right half of the country. Continuing on to our current imagery. Let me just press refresh on that. Just give it a moment as it's some great imagery here from Windy.com's visible satellite. Please bear with us during these times of loading. As we did originally stream this video live, you could have watched it at twitch.tv slash smashamash, a mobile app that actually alerts our viewers when we go live. And it is not showing up 
with Jack. I'll press refresh one more time and then press play. And if it doesn't show up, well, we'll have to call it a day. That is not working. Continuing on to our, our lightning mapper here, and we've had some significant lightning here off the Florida and Carolina coasts. We do have continuing thunderstorm activity out there. No terrestrial strikes here, but probably some great surf at the Outer Banks. Anyway, that's the current situation. If you've never checked out lightningmaps.org, it's super good. It's got all kinds of features that we don't typically set up. I mean, you can put in terrain, roads, you can show clouds, you can have uh, sound turned on for the lightning strikes and all kinds of different features here that we don't typically use. Maybe we'll explore more of that if we do some meteorology specialty videos. Let's close this thing out by showing the full 50 states of ALSA, the allegedly United States of America, former nation, now Banana Republic. It looks like that low is just south of Atlanta. And we'll focus on the lower 48 for the remainder of the video. There you go, that low just south of Atlanta there, lots of moisture there, making its way up through D.C. as we speak. There is your clouds and fog imagery. A bunch of low clouds there over the Gulf. And there is water vapor showing great indication of that low pressure. And it's not that moist. That air is fairly dry there. However, it is a huge pressure gradient. Almost like an inland hurricane in many ways, as it's got a, quite a strong counterclockwise rotation. So let's close things out here. There is your recap US Doppler radar, shortwave radiation. And there is the full water vapor map. It shows all the water vapor, not just clouds and fog. It shows all of it. And I think we've showed quite a bit of it today at the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. So thanks again for tuning in and congratulations on realizing the channel exists. I've been your host, Dan, a.k.a. smash mash signing off. And may that solar wind be at your back.